All right, so let's get started. It's 9 a.m. Uh, welcome, good morning. My name is Mustafa Hussein. I'm a professor of psychiatry, neurology, and internal medicine at Duty Southwestern Medical Center. I'm also an adjunct professor of neurology and psychiatry here at Duke, as well as a senior fellow of the Center of Aging and Human Development. It's a real pleasure to be back at Duke. I'd like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Igor, Dr. Dorswani. And sometimes we forget to thank people working behind the scenes, Galena, uh, Ms. Love, and others. It's been an amazing past last day with some very interesting talks. It's a very complicated, uh, uh, you know, how to put all of this together. But the way these presentations have brought this big data, analysis, methodology of a very difficult and an important topic, that is AD. Obviously, I would also like to thank Carl from AI, uh, from Alzheimer's Disease Association, for being part of this program and hope that we can continue this in the coming years. So we have a whole list of some top notch experts in the field. Uh, it's, a, it's going to be a very busy day. My job as a moderator would be that I would like to keep things on time. Uh, I'm already mentioning to other speakers, please, with all due respect, I will let you know when five minutes are left. If you can end on time or a little earlier, you may have a choice to have one or two questions. But if you fulfill your time, and we will only have the possibility of questions at the end of the day. So my advice would be if you can finish it earlier, that will be helpful and useful, especially for those who may be leaving or traveling. With that, let me begin. Our first speaker is our own, Dr. Morali Dorswami, who actually has contributed to put this meeting together too. Dr. Dorswami is a professor of psychiatry and professor of medicine in the Duke University School of Medicine. He is one of the most highly cited physician scientists at the Duke Institute of Brain Sciences. He's a senior fellow at the Duke Center for Precision Medicine and Applied Genomics, as well as Duke Microbiome Center. He directs clinical trials in AD and has been involved in modern diagnostic tests, apps, algorithms, therapeutics, in wide use today. Professor Durasami has been an advisor to leading government agencies, businesses, advocacy groups, including NIH, FDA, CDC, World Health Organizations, and others. And I don't know, I would very much like to bring in two. Dr. Dorsami has represented us at the World Economic Forum. He had been for the past several years, chair of the Mental Health Committee, where he really had brought attention to mental health, as well as issues related to aging and dementia in front of government agencies, presidents, prime ministers, big, corporations, and thank you, Dr. Dorsami, for your contribution in this area. Very much would like to invite him. His talk is on sex-related uh, issues with Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Dorsami. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Mustafa, for that very generous uh, and kind introduction. Uh, Igor, Carl, the rest of the Baru team, 
Uh, NIA, thank you for supporting this conference and organizing it. It's a world-class event, and I look forward to participating and helping you in the future. So this is uh, Women's History Month. May have been mentioned yesterday, but if not, I want to stress it again. Uh, celebrating the accomplishments of women. And I thought it's an appropriate time for me to focus on this topic of uh, gender and sex differences in Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to keep my talk short and sweet. Uh, we'll have lots of time uh, for questions. So I have some disclosures, which are uh, uh, standard disclosures, uh, received grants, uh, uh, et cetera, served as an advisor for a number of companies. I serve on some boards, uh, so on and so forth. So about uh, you know, eight or nine years ago, I saw this startling statistic, uh, and many of you have seen it. Uh, it goes two thirds of people in the US uh, with Alzheimer's are women. And my first thought was, wow. You know, uh, because I already knew that uh, women were also the, uh, you know, the vast majority of caregivers were also women. So but then my second scientific hat went on and I said, how could anyone possibly know if this is true or not? Where does this data come from? And if it is true, then what is the reason for it? Is it a biological reason? Is it a non-biological reason deriving from disparities? If it is not true, if it's an epiphenomenon due to some biases, such as a detection bias, then there's an equally important reason for us to let women know that this is a myth and it's not true. So in the last several years, I've sort of taken up um, a sort of a pet cause of trying to dig into different databases to try to see if I can uh, uncover the source of this and whether it's still accurate. The original source, I believe, was from the Chicago Health and Aging Study from 2011. The Alzheimer's Association did some human work to extrapolate it, but any extrapolation, as you know, has many, many assumptions. Can you extrapolate from Chicago to the rest of the country? I don't know. We certainly know that outside the US, this statistic is not true. And I did some digging into a number of other countries. So how could it be if it is true only in the US versus the rest of the world? Is that possible? So these are some of the questions that I, I don't have the answers for them, but I want to leave you with some of these questions. So there are three specific aims that I have uh, going into my talk, uh, and I'm focusing on one specific study. Are there gender and sex differences in the incidence and biology of Alzheimer's disease? How does education interact with gender? How do risk genes interact with sex? How do biomarkers such as A beta, tau, um, as well as inflammatory biomarkers, cardiometabolic biomarkers, how do they interact with sex? So there's a number of different databases that I could have gone into, and I've got a lot of data, but for the purpose of keeping it short here, I'm just going to focus on one particular study. Uh, this is sort of very fresh uh, off the press. Everyone's heard of the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, it's been going on for 70, 80 years, has contributed a lot of the knowledge that we know about prevention of cardiac disease, diabetes, uh, so on and so forth. And also they've collected very rich data on brain health and dementia incidence. So the particular uh, study that I'm going to focus on is a uh, cohort within the Framingham study called the Offspring Cohort. And this is a particular wave. The Framingham study has had several waves over 70 years. A particular wave is called wave seven, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. It's a relatively small sample we focused on uh, because they had to have all of the biomarkers and a lot of the other things that we were also interested in. So roughly about 1,500 people, 60 years or older. You can see roughly about half were women, half were men. Um, and then we required them to have baseline blood biomarkers, APOE4 status, AD pathological markers. In this case, I'm just going to focus on A-beta. I'll we can talk about tau later. Uh, a variety of uh, cardiovascular and metabolic uh, markers, you know, glucose, hemoglobin A1C, BMI, lipids, so on and so forth, and a bunch of inflammatory markers. So the goal was to see, you know, how these markers influenced incident Alzheimer's disease and also if there were sex differences in how these biomarkers uh, related to Alzheimer's disease. So this is the demographics uh, of this particular cohort. Uh, you can see that, uh, uh, you can see these slides, um, you know, roughly 791 women, 653 men, they did not differ in age. So the average age was about, uh, you know, 68, 69 years old. That means these were women who were born perhaps in the 1930s, uh, 1940s. 
Education level, you can see that uh, as expected, um, there are some uh, differences. Uh, there were more men than women with the college degrees and postgraduate degrees. APOE4 status uh, did not differ between the two groups. Interestingly, the MMSC score at entry into this wave seven, women um, you know, uh, tended to perform a little bit better than men, if anything. Also tell you a fact that many of you may not know, women tend to have bigger hippocampi than men when corrected for uh, intracranial volume. The thinking is that women have smaller brains, they do have smaller brains, but when you correct for intracranial volume, which men conveniently don't do sometimes, then they end up having a bigger relative brain size. Okay, so this is um, uh, some data on incident uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we've done some uh, adjustments for baseline variables and so on and so forth. I won't get into all the details, but if you look at uh, the entire sample, which is the very first panel, uh, the red uh, curve is uh, women, the blue curve is uh, men, and that's because this is a collaboration between Duke and Boston University. That's the blue is the Duke color. Um, the, uh, the red is the BU color. Uh, my two collaborators, Rhoda and uh, Chin Yu. So this is showing uh, you know, the percentage free of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that women um, have a greater, uh, greater um, uh, there are far more women who develop Alzheimer's disease than men uh, over the roughly, uh, you know, 12 years or so of follow-up. If you break this group down into those that carry the APOE4 allele and those who don't, you can see that the sex differences are primarily present in those who do not have the APOE4 allele. Um, both men and women who carry the APOE4 allele tend to develop Alzheimer's disease at roughly sort of the same um, uh, incidence or rate, if you will. So this is uh, looking at the effect of education. We broke education down into three categories, people with no high school, people with high school uh, and some college, uh, people who have finished college and or have postgraduate education. And this is pretty stunning. Uh, I was not expecting this, even though this clear a difference. So you can see the main difference between men and women is only in those who have not completed high school. As education levels increase, the gap between men and women closes to where once you have a college degree, there's no difference between men and women uh, in um, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. We looked at the association of a variety of baseline biomarkers. There were about 50 of them. I'm not gonna show all of them. I'm just gonna show a few just up for interest. Um, so the first one is uh, plasma A beta 42. So what we found was that lower plasma A beta 42 is associated with a higher risk for incident Alzheimer's disease. And likewise, uh, a ratio of A beta 42 to A beta 40 was also associated with incident AD. In this particular cohort, we found no relationship between BMI and AD, no relationship between systolic blood pressure, HDL levels, you know, lower HDL level was related to higher incident risk of Alzheimer's. Likewise, triglycerides, higher triglycerides, fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C were also related. Interleukin-6, which is uh, somewhat involved in the mediating uh, the brain response to you know, A-beta and so on and so forth, uh, was also a predictor um, in this proportional hazards value. And this is an adjusted p-value, which is adjusted for you know, baseline cognition, age, and so on and so forth. And then this is a very busy slide. It's looking at sex-specific association of biomarkers with incident AD. Um, the uh, first uh, four or so columns are the associations for women. And then the last four or so columns are the association for men. And the very last column is the statistical difference in the associations between men and women. So really the last column is the most important one. And you can pretty much see there's no p-value that is different. So in other words, the biomarkers have the same association with the risk for Alzheimer's disease in men as they do in women in this particular cohort. We're only talking about blood biomarkers here. We're not talking about brain biomarkers. So you can see sort of there's a trend. The very first row, you can see plasma A beta 42. You can see that plasma A beta 42 is highly significant predictor of incident AD in women, 
but not in men, but the p-value in men is weaker, but this is not statistically different. And likewise, you can see, you know, BMI, triglycerides, a few other things appear a little bit more significant in women. Some appear significant in men, but none of these are statistically different between men and women if we do a statistical test to compare the differences. We also looked at uh, the association of biomarkers with memory change as a continuous variable, as opposed to this categorical variable of incident dementia. Um, the only biomarker that differed between men and women was plasma A beta 42. The association was a little bit stronger in women uh, than it was in men. None of the other biomarkers differed between men and women in terms of their ability to predict incident AD or annualized memory change in this particular case. Just showing you one graphic, which is uh, we um, divided plasma A beta into quartiles. So you can see again, um, the first quartile, which is the lowest people with the lowest plasma A beta 42 levels who had the highest risk for incident AD. You can see that's where there's a big difference between men and women. Uh, and that's sort of the difference narrows, um, you know, as your A beta level gets uh, higher. So, you know, I was trying to interpret some of these data. And one of the most important things in Alzheimer's disease that is often not stated is that there is something called as a cohort effect. It depends on what generation of men and women that you're studying. So what I'm showing you in this slide is the trends in education level in men and women in America starting in 1940 and all the way through 2015 or so. So you can see between 1940 and 1950, a lot of people were not educated. So there was not really much of a difference between men and women. So if you study the cohort that went to college and grew up in that particular time frame, you probably would not see a big education effect. And then you see between 1950 to like around 1990 or so, around 1988, men really were much more educated than women, dramatically more educated than women, more likely to enter the labor force, you know, better off in all aspects. And then sometime around 1990, the lines crossed in the United States. Women became more educated, especially white women became more educated than white men. So if education was the cause for potential sex differences, it would be very crucial to see where your cohort originated and what, you know, you, you would want to study a cohort that was born and went to sort of school and college in the 1940s. You want another cohort that went to the 1970s. And then you would want to look at another cohort that's like 2015 to see if you know, uh, the same effects are seen over time or not. The two curves below show that African-Americans still have to catch up with regards to education. But even amongst them, the lines between women and men starts to cross around 1980. So every single time you see an epidemiological study, it's crucial to know when these people were born, when they went to school or college, and what was their cultural background when they grew up. So that's sort of one important thing. So the particular cohort that I showed you was in the late, sort of mid to late 1980s. So I don't know what would happen with the new Framingham cohort that's been recruited and is being studied now. We, we don't know what's going to happen with the younger generation of people. We, would the incidence of dementia reverse? In other words, would men start having more Alzheimer's than women? now that education level uh, in women has exceeded that in men. So anyway, so this is my summary. So I think the findings from this particular analysis is that low plasma A beta is linked to greater risk for AD. Uh, we also found some vascular ri the risks linked to AD. Women had a higher incidence of AD than men in this particular Framingham Heart Study offspring cohort. Uh, we don't know if this is a cohort effect. Is it biological? Is it both? Our findings suggest that there's probably some contribution of education, maybe some contribution of A beta. The FHS study uh, that I uh, just presented has many, many strengths. It's a landmark um, epidemiological study, but it's mostly a white sample, so I need to keep that in mind. And as I started with my talk, it's really crucial for us to know if sex differences in the risk for Alzheimer's disease is a true phenomenon caused by biological variables or whether it's an epiphenomenon or whether it's a cohort effect.
because that's really very, very important uh, priority for research. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Gursami. And as you promised, it's well in time. <laughs> so we will have time for questions, both from uh, the chat as well as from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, repeat the question. If you would repeat the question in the response. Sure. Um, the question is for APOE4, do you use the information available in legacy data or that from the uh, DB gap imputation data? That's a good question. So this cohort is relatively new in the 80s. So um, I just extracted it from the chart. So um, uh, from the database, um, I'm assuming it's legacy data. So uh, I, I would have to verify that. The second question is, did you see any differences in minor allele frequency of APOE in men and women in the Framingham offspring samples? Also, how do you account for family relationship of these samples in your analysis? Uh, we haven't looked at that. Um, I'm, I'm just presenting some top line um, differences. So uh, it's again, another uh, wonderful question. In the biomarker studies, it looked like a lot of the markers had a trend towards greater effect in women, though none were individually statistically different. What if you looked at the overall effect of the biomarkers that had a trend? Is the combined effect uh, uh, statistically significant? It's a great question. We haven't done that uh, particular analysis as well. So it's possible that it may trend if you had a bigger sample size. Um, so it's, it's entirely possible. Morali, thank you for presentation. It's nice. So, but I still have a question. So, look, we have difference in the risk, yeah, between female and male. Let, let's try to summarize uh, which factors generates this difference. Let's start from genetics. Uh, as I understand, genetic is not very responsible for this difference because you demonstrated that APOE is similar uh, for both. We found yeah, the APOE4, yeah. But, but what about ascertainment and so on and so forth? That there could be some issues because this is an older cohort, but yes. But what about other genes? Do you think that we can find other genes uh, responsible for this difference? Yeah, it's entirely possible. We have not looked at it. Um, we have looked at uh, the ADNI database and we found a whole bunch of genetic markers and genetic crosstalks that are different. Um, we have not found a way to replicate those findings. That's why I didn't present them today. So mm -hmm. it's entirely possible. Okay. Uh, what about non-genetic predictors? What would you uh, think the most important uh, predictor responsible for disparities? So, um, so we looked at uh, sex binding um, hormones. We didn't find any differences in blood levels of those. So the genes related to reproductive status could be responsible, but not, they're not measurable in blood biomarkers. We, um, we know that tau levels uh, seem to differ between men and women at baseline. So genes related to tau uh, may be implicated potentially. And I already told you that there's some difference as far as A beta, uh, even though APOE is not perhaps involved, there are other genes that could be involved in A-beta uh, processing that may differ. So, um, <coughs> mm -hmm. so I, I don't have a good answer for that, but it's possible. One, the, the problem is once you start looking at a lot of uh, genetic variables, you know, there are thousands and thousands of variables, you need very large sample sizes to make sure mm -hmm. that it's not a spurious finding. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're, you're speaking now uh, at the level of biomarkers. If to uh, speak about, for example, comorbidities or maybe body mass index, something uh, measured in uh, uh, survey data sets, for example. So we know that women are more likely um, to report depression symptoms. We know that women are more likely to have certain immune disorders. We know that men are perhaps more likely to have some cardiovascular diseases. But one of the things we've noticed in Framingham is it's a dramatic increase in the percentage of people using antihypertensives. Uh, anti-cholesterol medicines. So perhaps some of those differences may have disappeared in this latest cohort. If we look at earlier cohorts, maybe we may account for some comorbidities. So, you know, it's possible that 
uh, in men, the vascular pathway may be like more important and in women, maybe the A beta pathway or the tau pathway is more important. And this is just a very, you know, it's off the top of my head guess. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. But again, you know, the importance of education <clears throat> until you can rule out the education effect and see what is the residual effect that is not accounted for by education, only then you can start digging into, I think, genetics and biology and stuff like that. We still don't know how much is biology and how much is kind of a pure education effect. And education could be a detection bias or it could be a true, some kind of a cognitive protective effect, you know, like cognitive reserve or something like that. Do we understand uh, a specific mechanism of generating Alzheimer's disease for different education level? Uh, cognitive reserve is the basket term used. <laughs> I don't think anyone has looked at what different doses of education do to different parts of the brain. And maybe John, maybe uh, David, maybe, you know, you know this from the Rush data set. Yeah. From postmortem, I don't know. Have you looked at different educational levels and how it corresponds to different? Very hard, very often. And every... We've been studying this for, you know, 25 years and we've looked very hard. Uh, we have several papers on education. Every one of them finds something different. All right, so if you just line them up, all right, anything that you could possibly imagine we could find, we have found and reported, all right. <laughs> uh, the most recent paper, uh, which has the largest sample size and the longest follow-up, is, um, is that there's simply no effect on education, of education, on changing cognition. There's a big level effect, and it's maintained, all right. So depending on how you go about deciding on a label of dementia, it could be a detection issue, or it could be simply that, you know, it's better to start with a higher level of cognition. Um, you know, so um, in terms of what education is doing to the brain at a molecular level, we, we've not been able to find anything. We do find uh, and we've reported a number of genes and proteins associated with resilience or reserve, all right? But we haven't found any sex differences. The, the only real sex difference, um, well, not sex difference, but we have reported that surgical menopause is associated with a faster rate of cognitive decline and more AD pathology. Um, and, um, you know, the effect on cognition was reported by uh, Walter Rocha from Mayo. Um, so, I mean, that seems real. Uh, we have a paper now we're putting together with the um, estrogen genes and uh, some of the molecular pathways around that. And there's some small Fantastic. effects there. Um, but the only other thing I want to mention is, um, is, is, you know, the biggest effect of, of women making this a women's health disease is simply longevity. And it's hard to get age specific differences between men and women as you get above age 85 or 90, where you simply run out of men. All right. Um, you know, so we have a marvelous protective factor, which is that we die, you know, five years younger. Um, not the one I would want. Um, you know, so it's it's hard to know how big the sex differences are. They I, I think they're smaller than they initially appear. Um, in terms of sex differences. Yeah, I agree. Great. And I, I want to end with a very funny statistic that I came across in my research for this topic. It turns out that American men have recognized there's something to this phenomenon that women are getting educated at higher rates than them. There's a dramatic increase in the number of men who are marrying women who are far more highly educated than them. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, uh, may I have a comment? Uh, sure. We have uh, raised hands uh, uh, from uh, Go ahead. Alexander. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, really great talk, but uh, just uh, I would like just emphasize one point. When we are talking about uh, APOE, usually we are talking, uh, most people are talking about the four allele, which is the strongest um, allele uh, conferring risk of Alzheimer's disease. However, we forget, in many cases, we forget about protective effects. And protective effects, in this case, comes from E2 allele. And uh, the risk uh, is the balance between protection and um, predisposition, right? So 
um, uh, women can be more protected against such kind of disease than men. And actually, we did show this in our recent study. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to look at that, uh, and I'm going to email my collaborator right after this talk to look at that particular. Uh, ah, okay. You can replicate yeah. it. Could I, could, I have, could I have two comments? Oh. Just, just, just a minute, uh, Anatoly, let, let, let me say. So we, we still don't have a second speaker on uh, our... Uh, yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Oh, you, you are here. Good, good. <laughs> All right. So but we don't have time for the question. Dr. Rasami, that was wonderful. And again, <clears throat> we, we continue talking at uh, discussion uh, session. Okay. If you okay. have questions in the Q&A list, we can uh, continue. Yeah, please start Tell, with Would you this. like to continue with the Q&A or with the next speaker? Because we are on time for the next speaker. And we will, Dr. Dorsami, I know they have to travel. And if there are, are any more questions, Dr. Dorsami, Morali, would you be able to answer if there are any more questions? Right now, I can if you want me to, but we do have a few questions. But we are also out of time. So if you have a. Dr. Dursami have to travel. travel yeah. So uh, we may allow one more question, please. So I'm just going to find the next serial. Marwan, thank you for giving me a minute of your time. Uh, 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 do, Morali, it's good to see, hear from you, my friend. Absolutely. I'm going to hear you while I'm driving. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the questions is, do you think that education is related to early life neuronal growth? Of course it is. Uh, there's a wonderful paper. It's called Neurons to Neighborhoods. I would highly recommend um, whoever asked the question I, I, to, uh, I guess it's Heather, or I'm not sure who asked the question, but whoever it is uh, to read this. The question then becomes, how is this related to Alzheimer's risk? We don't know. A group at UNC has done some amazing MRI studies of uh, uh, infants and uh, very young children uh, and looked at the relationship between APOE4 uh, and other genes and their brain MRI volumes, and they do find some changes. So we know that um, uh, there are early life changes that could have late life uh, impacts. Uh, I do, we just don't know how that translates into Alzheimer's risk yet. But likewise, uh, poverty and other socioeconomic factors can have similar impacts as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussami. It was wonderful. And I really like the discussion following his talk. And that's what I would advise to our speakers. If we can limit our talk to 20, 25 minutes, we can have a wonderful discussion as we did.